Hello, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everybody, wherever it might be. Today, it's my great pleasure to introduce Sophia Emma Mikkelsen. Uh, she is from Denmark, from uh, southern Denmark, actually. And uh, I'm not sure that we ever met in person. I don't know, but 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 <laughs> no. <laughs> but yeah. Sophia uh, uh, was my uh, student uh, at uh, my uh, course on path algebra at the University of Warsaw. You see, it's one of the few advantages of the current pandemic that you can have students from all over Europe attending your lecture course. And Sophia was uh, was one of them. Uh, this is a topic which is very dear to my heart graph algebras, and I'm very happy that uh, Sophia will tell us uh, about some very, very interesting new developments concerning uh, graph sister algebras. So the title is on the classification of quantum lens spaces. Sophia, the floor is yours, the Zoom is yours, take it away. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for the introduction and the invitation. So in this talk, I will, it will contain of uh, two main parts. So. The first one will be on the description of quantum lens spaces as graph sister algebras, which is a joint work both with Thomas Gottfossen and Nathan Ruiz. And after that, uh, I will move on with the classification of um, quantum lens spaces if, of dimension less than or equal to seven, uh, which is a joint work with Thomas Gottfossen. So um, yeah, this is the plan. Uh, so the first thing I want to do is to describe quantum lens spaces as graph sister algebras. Uh, so they um, have already been uh, described as graph sister algebras um, first due to Hung and Sumansky um, for some um, quantum lens spaces. And then it was later generalized by Brzezinski and Sumansky to include um, all quantum lens spaces. Uh, but then after uh, we have been working on this uh, classification of these quantum lens spaces, it was pointed out to us by Ifan Ruiz that the description uh, is not always correct. So in some cases, um, we need an, another graph, um, and that's what I want to present for you. Um, after that, we will move on with a classification result of graph sister algebras of finite graphs due to Eilers, rest of Ruiz, and Sanson, which I will use uh, to present some classification results of quantum lens spaces of dimension less than or equal to seven um, with some conditions on the defining weights. So let me first um, give you the definition of uh, quantum lens spaces. quantum lens spaces. Yeah, so quantum lens spaces, they are defined as um, a fixed point algebra of the quantum sphere by Waxman and Seibelman. So let me first recall for you the definition of that. So um, the quantum sphere by Waxman and Seibelman <clears throat> Yeah, so we take a parameter q between zero and one, um, and then this uh, quantum sphere uh, is q two and plus one. Um, the sister algebra of it is the universal sister algebra generated by um, n plus one elements. Uh, subject um, to the following relations. So we have that set i set j equals q set j set i when i is less than j um, and set i set j star equals q set j star set i for i different from j. And if i and j are the same, then set i star set i equals set i set i star plus one minus q to the squared set j set j star. Um, yeah, so as you see, if, um, if q equals one, uh, then everything commutes. Um, and then of course, they also satisfies um, the sphere relation which makes it into a quantum sphere. Um, yeah, so in the case- uh, Sorry, Sophia, just a stupid yeah. question. 
uh, here in the second commutation relation, you, you really just want A not equal to J, not A less than J. Uh, which one, sorry, did you the, say? The second one, I, I can, uh, yeah, it's probably this one, yeah. Uh, so, did you mean here or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so it's, one, yeah. It's, it's, it's also when, when, when I is bigger than J, you also have that it's just the same Q on the right, yes? Ah, I just wrote, okay, so maybe it was just that I is not J. Yeah. Yeah. That's what you want, okay. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. And now if Q equals one, uh, then C of S Q uh, two and plus one will just be the commutative um, mm -hmm. This algebra of the continuous function of uh, the odd sphere. Okay, so now um, if we let M be uh, this tuple here of some numbers MI, some natural numbers different from zero, um, these, uh, I will refer to this as the set of weights. Um, then we have that by universality that C of SQ2 and plus one admits um, an action of um, this finite cyclic uh, group set mod R. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and it's giving as follows. So if we let theta um, be a generator of set mod R, then the action is given by this row MR and it maps set I to theta MI, set I. Okay, um, then we can define the, these quantum land spaces. So then C of LQ 2N plus one uh, M, which we denote these quantum land spaces as, uh, they are defined as the fixed point algebra of this Faxman and Sauron quantum sphere um, under this action here. Yeah. Okay. Um, so now uh, just a very uh, quick remark that these uh, quantum land spaces um, where they actually shows up in non-commutative Geometry. So there have been some work uh, by various of researchers on um, on these quantum land spaces as the total space of some line bundles. So of some non-commutative line bundles, where the base space is a complex predictive spaces or weighted predictive spaces, and here the K theory has been. Um, computed using the structure as a line bundle. Um, but I also want to mention my motivation for looking more into uh, classification of these quantum land spaces uh, comes from um, non-commutative uh, fiber bundles. So I started looking at these quantum land spaces in my work on constructing um, non commutative fiber bundles where both the fiber and uh, the total space are quantum land spaces, but this is still ongoing work. But that's where I started uh, getting interesting in these um, quantum land spaces. Yeah, so let's move to uh, the first point. Um, so these quantum land spaces as uh, graph cyst algebras. Okay, so let me first recall for you. Uh, what a graph cyst algebra is, uh, since this is uh, important for the topic, of course, because we want to classify uh, graph cyst algebras. So um, first we have a directed graph. E, uh, so it consists of two sets, E0 and E1, where E0 and E1, they are countable, uh, countable sets, and E0, consist of the vertices in the graph and E1 of the edges in the graph. And then um, we also have two maps, uh, this um, range and the source maps, which are maps from E1 to E0. Um, so if we have an edge E, uh, then the range of E 
with W and the source of E equals V. Okay, so now um, a graph sister algebra denoted by a sister of E uh, is the universal sister algebra. generated by two families. So the first one is the family <clears throat> of projections. And these projections, they are indexed by all the vertices in the graph. And um, also a family of partial isometries. which are indexed by uh, all the edges in the graph. And then they have to satisfy some relations. So first we have that these uh, predictions, uh, they are mutually orthogonal. Um, the partial isometries, uh, they have mutually orthogonal ranges. And then the next two relations are known as the Kunz-Kruger relations. Uh, so first we have that the prediction SE star SE equals pre precisely the um, prediction corresponding to the vertex the range of E. And then we have that SE, SE star. Um, this is a prediction of P S of E. And then as you see now that if we take the sum over all these SE, SE stars, uh, where the source of E equals V, then we obtain the prediction corresponding to the uh, vertex V. Um, and here, this is only true. Uh, we only need this if uh, we have that, the set we take the sum over all these edges here um, is non-empty and uh, finite. So yeah, as I said, these are known as the Kunz-Kruger relations, uh, which originally defined uh, Kunz-Kruger algebras, uh, which are graphs, uh, sister algebras where the graph uh, is finite. So the set of vertices and the set of edges is finite. Um, and also they contain no sinks and sources, meaning that all the uh, vertices in the graph either emits, uh, they both emits and receives at least uh, one vertex. Okay, so now we can start uh, with the description of these uh, quantum spheres as um, graph sister algebras. So due to Hong and Szymanski, uh, we have that these quantum spheres, they are indeed graph sister algebras. Uh, for a graph we denote by L2n plus one. And L2n plus one has vertices um, V0, uh, V1 to Vn. And it has edges Eij, um, where i is greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to one, uh, j which is less than or equal to n. Um, and then the source of Eij equals Vi and the range of Eij equals Vj. <clears throat> okay, so for example, um, if we have n equals three, uh, then we will have four vertices, V0 to V3, uh, they are all, uh, the base of a loop um, and then we have edges going like this. Yeah. Okay, so I want to uh, remark that an important consequence of uh, this result here um, is that C of SQ 2n plus 1, they are all isomorphic uh, when Q is between 0 and 1. 
is simply because the graph uh, don't see the cues. Um, yeah. And also, this isomorphism here is highly non trivial. Um, it is constructed using some analytic argument. And so they actually did write up an explicit isomorphism, but it involves some infinite um, series. But even true, we can still see how we can translate uh, the action on this uh, these quantum spheres um, onto this uh, sister algebraic uh, description. So under this isomorphism, okay. Um, but I'm gonna get yeah. where this graph comes from. It's just for q equals zero. I'm gonna uh, Piotr pointed this out last time. Also, okay. like, Sorry, uh, what did you see? So. Uh, uh, like the yes, so the, the isomorphism is not, of course, highly non-trivial. But I mean, like, mm. uh, it's not like something obscure. Like I mean, like the the isomorphism comes just that uh, they are all isomorphic to Q equals zero, mm. and for Q equals zero, you have the graph. Yeah. Straight uh, in front of you, like. Yeah, but yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, that's right. Um... Like for Q equals zero, if you just put Q equals zero, like. Uh, mm into the equation, then you just yeah, have so, a problem. Yeah, I, I actually, I need to include. It's not like some abstract, uh, yes, exactly. And like, it's not like some abstract, uh, like um, isomorphism. It's like a concrete one. Like, yeah, 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 exactly. Yes, so you have a concrete one, but it's not uh, that trivial how it looks like. Yes, um, yeah. yeah, yeah, precisely. And also when, as I was about to say, that when you look at the isomorphism, it's this that explicit isomorphism is still, uh, yeah, we can directly see how this action translates into the graph system algebraic structure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but under, you have yeah. Q universe mm -hmm. in your relations uh, somewhere explicitly. Uh, could you go no. back and show us the relation no. just for a second? No, you can just straight plug in Q equals zero. And that's also like what uh, ah, no, Armin no, no, Chimansky did. Like, I mean, like, they realized uh, this. Yeah, you have it. Yeah. Ah, yes, it's just... one minus Q squared. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So no, 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 just, no, just... no, no. Uh, it's not one over Q. It's not no. Q inverse. No, it's one minus Q squared. I said it's fine. Yes. Yeah, yes, yeah. yes, exactly. Yeah. So you can yeah. just plug Q equals zero and then you have your okay. relations. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So under this isomorphism, uh, this action. Rho um, R uh, becomes the following. So I will just denote it still by uh, Rho M R. So Rho um, R on the, um, on the predictions, we'll just map to the predictions. And we have the Rho M R on the uh, partial isometries. Um, they are mapped to this theta, this generator of uh, the groups at mod R uh, to the power of uh, the weight corresponding to uh, i, and then we have S E I J. So see, it only depends on um, mm -hmm. on the i and not the j. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so now um, we, of course, now we know that these C of L Q two and plus one R M uh, they will then be isomorphic to the fixed point algebra of this graph sister algebra under the above action. And now it follows by a resolve by um, due to CRISP from 2008. Uh, since this is an action of a discrete group, uh, that this um, fixed point algebra of this graph sister algebra is isomorphic to a corner of another graph sister algebra. Um, okay. And this graph here is known as the screw product graph. I will give you the definition in a minute and I will also explain what uh, the prediction is. But let me first mention that, um, as I also said in the beginning, that quantum lens spaces, um, they are described as graph system algebras. First by um, Hong and Szymanski. In 
2003. Um, in the case where the greatest common divisor of all the weights with um, the order of the acting group is one. And then it was uh, generalized by Brzezinski and Szymanski. in 2018 uh, to include all quantum lens spaces. And here the problem is that this description here is not always correct, um, which was pointed out by Efron Ruiz. Okay, so uh, let me describe for you this uh, screw product graph here. Um, and then I will also give you a Counter example, counter example showing why this is not always correct. Okay, so uh, this graph here, this screw product graph, L2 and plus one, this set mod R, it has um, the following vertices. So they are tuples with a VI and a K, and uh, the VIs are just uh, um, the vertices coming from. Uh, the graph L2 and sorry, plus one. Um, and then we have that K goes from zero to R minus one. So corresponding to the elements in set mod R. And then it has the edges uh, in a similar way. So we have EIJK um, where I less than or equal to J from zero to N. And K is the same as before. Then I need to tell you what the source and the range map is, but let me first um, give you the intuition. So we have, if we have a vertex VIL, uh, then there exists an edge to, um, to the vertex where you take VJ, uh, J can also be the same as I. And then you add MI to L, and you calculated modulo R. And this edge here will be EIJ, um, comma L plus MI. Uh, so you indicate here um, the number where the edge end ends. So if we want to write the source on an edge EIJK, uh, then you get VI K minus mi modulo r and the range of eijk is just given by vjk okay so let me give you um, an example so if we take um, this group product graph for l3 um, set mod four, and we take the set of weights to be two and one. Then since uh, we look at um, L3, we have, uh, it has two vertices, V0 and V1. So we will have two levels in this um, graph. And then since um, R equals four, uh, we have four vertices in each level. So these are denoted by V0, 0, V1, 0, and so on. And here we have V1, 0, and so on. And then we know that we will have an edge between V0, 0, and V, oh, sorry, it should be a 0 here, um, and a 1 here, yeah. And V0, 2, because we have to add uh, M0, which is 2. And now when we add uh, 2 again, to, uh, to the two here, uh, then since we calculated modulo four, um, we will get an edge going back again here. And similarly here. So uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so we will have two um, cycles at the first level and in the bottom here, since M1 is just one, we just have it just like this. Um, and then they are also, the two levels are also connected um, and this is the similar, a similar system. So we have an edge from V0, 0 to V1, uh, 2. And similarly, like this. 
yeah, not, yeah. And then um, we also have one going like this and like this. Okay. Um, and let me also uh, mention for you what this, um, now we know what this group product graph is. So let me also write to you what this P is because this P, projection P here, which we take the corner of, um, is the sum over all the P, V, I zeros where I goes from zero to N. So you take uh, the sum over all the projections uh, down here in this group product graph. Okay, so now uh, to finally um, describe for you what this graph is uh, given by um, Brzezinski and Sumanski, I need the definition of um, what is called ad admissible paths in these, these graphs. Uh, so we say that a path from a v i s to a v j t inside this uh, screw product graph. is called admissible. If it does not pass through any VLK uh, for which we have that L uh, goes from I to J and uh, k goes from zero to the greatest common divisor of um, L uh, minus one. So if we look at uh, the example from before, then we need to look at all paths which do not pass through a v, oh, sorry, this one, a v zero zero and um, v zero one, because the greatest common divisor in this case is uh, two. Oh, sorry, it should be like this. Yeah, um, so they cannot pass through uh, these two red vertices I marked and then also this V1 zero. And then of course, if we have more levels in our, um, in, in this screw product graph, uh, meaning that if this dimension here of these um, quantum um, spheres is higher, uh, then of course we also would have some levels in between where we have some vertices which we cannot pass through. Um, and as you also see that when, since we uh, don't allow uh, the path to go through these particular vertices, we cannot have any infinite paths. Um, yeah. Okay, so now um, Brzezinski and Szymanski claim that that C of LQ to n plus one uh, M is isomorphic to the graph sister algebra of a graph noted by L to n plus one uh, M. Okay, um, yeah, go to the next page and explain this um, graph here. So L to n plus one uh, M, it has uh, the following vertices. So they are denoted V, I, B, where I again goes from zero to N and B goes from zero to the greatest common divisor of M, I, R minus one. So I will give you an example in just <coughs> after the definition. Um, and then we have um, some edges uh, denoted by E, I, J, S, T. And then we have one more index A. Um, and again, we have that I, the same, con oh, sorry, the same conditions as the other times. Um, and then we have this A, which goes from one to N, I, J, S, T, where this N, I, J, S, T, um, is the number of admissible paths 
from uh, VIS to VJT. And the source of EIJSTA is given by VIS, and the range is given by VJT. Okay, so let me give you an example to understand this definition better. So if we look at the same um, example as before, so we have this L3 um, um, set mod 4 um, equals to one. Uh, then we have these um, two levels with four vertices in each of them. And as you saw, we had these um, two cycles showing up here and one in the bottom, and then they are connected. Uh, so what we do now is that we take uh, these um, vertices here. This was B0, 0, 0, and B, sorry. These two here. Okay, so then we have this V0, 0, 0 and V0, 1. Uh, so now in our new graph, this L three R M. Here we will have. You can look at it as we have two levels again, and now we have picked these red vertices. So this we denote by V zero zero, V zero one, and V one zero. And then we need to indicate um, how many edges we have between them and the number of edges between them correspond precisely to the number of admissible paths in this graph over here. So the number of edges between V00 and V10 is the number of admissible paths between V00 and V10 over here. So here we will see that we can either go like this and then go down um, to the vertex here, or we can just go uh, directly down here and like this. So we would have two uh, edges here and similarly over here. And then they will all be the base of a loop because we have the cycles um, in this group product graph. So, so going from these group product graphs to this um, other graph here describing these lens spaces, um, you see that we need to count uh, the number of these admissible paths, which makes it uh, difficult to construct um, these adjacency matrices, which we will see later on, because it's a lot of work uh, counting all these paths. Okay, so... Um, Sorry, Sophia, could you please remind yeah. me uh, how do you distinguish these uh, three vertices in this left-hand side graph? Why these three? Why those three? Oh, it's because, uh, so we have to pick the vertices um, where, um, where you denote them by this VIB, where B goes from zero to the greatest common divisor minus one. So in the first one, we need to take two of them because here the greatest common divisor is two uh, because R is four. Uh, so mm -hmm. we need to take V zero zero and V zero one. But in the uh, second level here, uh, the greatest common divisor is just one, so okay. you only take one of them. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So, so you can see, like, when you have more than one cycle, so you need to pick the number of vertices corresponding to the number of cycles. So we have one uh, in each of them. Okay. Um, so now uh, let me give you a counter example. Um, uh, I have sure. a question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. About paths. In in the graph, each edge is directed. Each has each edge has a direction. Yeah, yeah, they have. Yeah. When when you make a path from one vertex to another vertex, hmm? path required to be consistent with the direction of the edges. When you move along an edge, are you required to move in the given direction of that edge? Yes, you are. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so now let's look at a counterexample uh, where we will show that C of LQ3 for um, 2, 1 is not isomorphic 
uh, to the graph sister algebra of L3421, which is precisely the graph I showed you here. Okay, so uh, we know that C of L Q3 4 um, is isomorphic uh, to the corner where we take P0 0 plus P V1 0. Um, this is, I will just call it P. So we take the corner of this uh, screw product graph here. <clears throat> so this is just a result due to uh, CRISP. Um, and now I claim that this is the same as the corner of another graph C style algebra. And this graph G, um, let me draw it for you. So here you have a cycle above here and you just have it just going like this. And then we have one down here and one down here. So it's actually, this a sim it looks similar as the graph I have above here, uh, but now I have removed uh, this cycle here and all the edges coming out of it. And then we only look at this part of the graph. And it comes from the fact uh, that when you take the corner, since we take the corner by uh, these projections here, then the corner don't see all um, the part of, of the graph uh, where you don't have an edge coming from a V0, 0 or V1, 0 to these vertices. So you see that uh, everything um, which comes out of uh, these two uh, vertices here um, is not connected to either V0, 0 or of course V1, 0, and therefore they cannot be in, um, in this corner. So therefore we can look at this, um, this mm -hmm. graph G instead. Um, and now uh, we can apply a number of times um, what is called the collapse move. I will not explain it in details, but the idea is that you can collapse this vertex here into one vertex, uh, and then you have an extra edge going out of it. And then you can do a similar trick uh, in the last level here, where you first collapse the first one and then the next one and so on. And then you uh, get a, another graph. Um, let me denote it by E. Looks like this. Yeah. Um, and it follows by a theorem that uh, the graph sister algebra of G is stable isomorphic to the graph sister algebra of E. Okay. <clears throat> So now let me, uh, before we move on, let me recall um, a few things about um, the ideal structure. So first, uh, let me remind you what uh, the gauge action is on a graph sister algebra. So now just take a general graph sister algebra E. Uh, then we have uh, this natural action of the circle uh, called the gauge action, uh, which maps <coughs> the EV to just PV and the partial isometries to W SE for W in your one. Okay, so now um, if we look at E being a finite graph, uh, then I want to look at this um, set of all proper ideals, which are both prime and gauge invariants, and we denote them by prime gamma C star of E. So as I said, these are all ideals, uh, which are both prime and gauge invariant ideals. And they should also be proper. Um, then there exists a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, the set of these ideals and what is called the components of the graph and we denote it by gamma E. And uh, these, uh, this set here, gamma E, it consists of all, what is called all the maximal strongly connected subsets 
and a subset is strongly connected if you, for any two vertices in the set, can find a path between them. So, for example, in our case here, you see that for this graph here, uh, the strongly connected component will just consist of uh, these um, singletons of the vertices because we only have paths going in, in this direction here. Okay. Um, and uh, then uh, it also consists of all singletons of what is called singular uh, vertices uh, that are not the base of a cycle. So when you say maximal strongly connected subsets, you mean subsets of the set of vertices, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yes. Uh, sorry, what do we say? What is I, I, I'm wondering about this phrase. The, when you say subsets, yeah, you should say what the set is. Uh, okay, yeah, okay. So strongly connected subsets of E0. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. what I said. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, precisely. Yeah, okay. And then it also consists of all single sums of these singular vertices, singular meaning that um, that the source inverse of V is either empty or infinity, um, mm -hmm. which are not the base of cycle. So in our case, mm -hmm. we don't have any of these um, singular vertices. Um, yeah. Okay, so now if- e uh, Sorry, is, could you tell me one yeah. more time what strongly connected means? Yeah, strongly connected means that you, for any, if you pick two vertices, then you need yes. to find a path between them. So in both directions. Ah, in both directions. Both okay. directions, yeah. So you pick okay. any two vertices yeah. you pick, you have, yeah. So yeah, that's okay, why, and, and then, then they should be maximal. Um, so in our case, it will just be single sums of vertices in all yeah. the cases we consider. Yeah. Okay, so now we have you. this, yeah, we have this uh, one to one corresponding, uh, corresponding is uh, this homomorphism between these two sets. Um, and I should also mention <clears> now I have assumed that E is finite, but actually this is also true if just E zero is finite and we have some conditions on all the infinite emitters. So I will not come more into that because we will only look at um, finite graphs. Okay. Um, okay, so now let me, let me see here. Um, yeah. Okay, so let, let's come back to, uh, to this corner again. Uh, so now we know um, that this, uh, that the sister algebra of D is stable isomorphic to the graph sister algebra of E. Uh, it can also be shown that P is mm. a full projection uh, inside a C star of G. Hence, we have that C of LQ three four M um, will actually be stable isomorphic to uh, the graph sister algebra of G. So it comes from here because we, if um, P is full in this uh, sister algebra here, then this corner is stable isomorphic to uh, this graph sister algebra here. It's followed by a resolved by Brown. Um, so now we know uh, that these two are stable isomorphic. So what does it uh, mean when a projection is full? So if you uh, take uh, the dense, um, that this, uh, if you take uh, P is C star of E, mm -hmm. uh, then so it's dense in the C star algebra. Yeah. Ah, so okay. if you, so yeah, okay. So if you look at it, for, and in this case, it follows just using um, the defining relations for this graph C star algebra. You essentially, because you have a path from uh, this ver these vertices to all the rest mm -hmm. of them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so now um, we know that um, this prime E gamma um, of the sister algebra of um, for M equal to three. Remember this, this graph here um, is the graph we have here. So since we have three vertices um, and the definition of the strongly connected components says that uh, the strongly connected components just consist of 
the single stones of these um, vertices. So we have three of them. And similarly, we have that the prime gamma sister of um, E equals two. Remember, we have this graph E here. Okay, so uh, it follows that C star of L3 for M uh, cannot be stable isomorphic uh, to this graph C star algebra here. Okay, um, and we also know, um, let's see here, yeah, so we know that these two cannot be stable isomorphic, but we also know that this is stable isomorphic to the graph C star algebra of G. Uh, which is stable isomorphic to C of LQ to this quantum lens space here. Okay, so from uh, this um, argument here, we have in the end uh, that C star of L3, this graph C star algebra here, cannot be isomorphic to this quantum lens space. which is our counterexample. Okay, so um, let me say that the problem comes um, since when you look at this corner here, precisely because when you look at this, uh, the corner here, then we don't see uh, this part here of the screw product graph and everything going out of it. So precisely the reason why I defined this graph G. So in the definition by, um, of this graph by Brzezinski and Szymanski, we need to restrict uh, the number of vertices um, we choose to look at here um, further. So we need to, we, we don't need to have this uh, B going to the greatest common divisor of MIR minus one. We need to actually choose less vertices in some of the cases. Um, so for that, um, I need a bit of notation. So let me first um, let me first recall for you um, that a subset H inside E zero is hereditary if um, if we have a V in H and we have a W in E zero uh, such that V is greater than uh, sorry, V squared and W, such that there's a path from V to W, uh, then um, W should also be in H. Okay, so um, the next is just some notation to uh, change this graph. So now we let this H R M um, be the smallest hereditary subset of uh, this group product graph. Yeah, of the vertices of this group product graph, which contains uh, these vi zeros for i equals zero to n. Because then we make sure that, um, that we always have a path um, to, mm -hmm. onto the, from these vi zeros to the vertices. Mm -hmm. um, and then we let si, be all the k inside zero to the greatest common divisor of m i r minus one, such that v i r v i k um, lies in this h r m. So again, just some notation. Um, mm -hmm. And here also note that this zero only consists of zero, because if you have some cycles at the first level, then you don't have any edge from v zero zero to some v um, zero K where K is greater than this greatest common divisor minus one. Okay, so um, now we have a modified graph. Um, which we denote by L2 and plus one bar uh, M. And it has vertices V I K. And now I goes from, again, zero to N, but now we have that K lies in this SI. So in some cases we have removed some of the vertices and the edges 
E I J S T A. I go again from zero to N. And now we have that this S has to be an SI and T inside SD. And uh, A is the same as before. It's, it goes from zero to the number of these admissible paths. Uh, so you see that the only thing we have changed is that we have to restrict uh, the vertices a bit. Um, so here, um, note that this L bar will always be the same as um, L. Um, I've not denoted all the, uh, the R's and M's and the dimension. But this will be true whenever the greatest common divisor of M0 and R equals one. Because in this case, you can always find a path from B00 to the rest of the vertices. And then you don't have the problem as we saw in this count by example. Okay. Um, so now let me very briefly um, give you just a quick idea of um, how we proved this. <clears throat> so um, now we have that, this is the resolve by Thomas Gottfrosen, F1 Ruiz. Okay, so which says that as graph sister algebra, uh, sorry, we have that these quantum land spaces, they are isomorphic to this graph sister algebra. Hello, Maxi. Hey, okay, um, so now uh, just to give you a very quick idea of the proof, and then you also see what goes wrong in the proof by Pushinsky and Szymanski. So what we did was to um, construct a map from this graph sister algebra here um, to um, a corner, just don't have a Q of this screw product graph. And now Q here is the sum of all the PVI K, uh, where I goes from zero to N and K has to be an SI. And then we show that this is an isomorphism mapping PVI K to PVI K, um, where K has to be an SI. Um, in the proof by Brzezinski and Szymanski, uh, they defined a similar map, but here they looked at, instead of having this Q I have here, then they take the corner with the projection, uh, with the sum of all these projections PVI K, PVI zeros from I equals zero to N. But as you see, uh, the problem is now that if you take uh, the projection like this and you take the corner, uh, then you have that all these PVI Ks, where they said that K should go from zero to the greatest common device minus one, they are not contained in the corner. So they map the projections to something, uh, to some projection which are not contained in uh, that particular corner. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, so that's what goes wrong here. Um, mm -hmm. And to fix that part, um, we, have, we have from showing that uh, that we have this isomorphism here. Uh, we will have that these quantum lens spaces, uh, M, that they will be isomorphic um, to these PQs, of course, the star of L2 and plus one, M set R, QP. But then using that isomorphism, we obtain that they are isomorphic to the corner of this graph sister algebra L. 2 and plus 1 are uh, um, with this prediction P. And now we have to show that this is act this corner is isomorphic to the corner of the graph. Uh, sorry, to the graph just like about of the graph itself. And this to show that part uh, requires some work. Um, so here we use uh, Sophia, the description. Excuse me. Yeah. Just, mm -hmm. just uh, can you remind me with set SI what it is? Yeah. Um, so we have it here. So it's the set here. So the set telling you telling you how many of the vertices is contained in this um, hereditary subset. So it tells you which VI case are contained in that hereditary subset. Okay. 
and uh, okay, and this is a set <clears throat> of numbers, but yeah, exactly. uh, but but you must have this extra condition satisfied. So some of these numbers yeah. between zero and GCD might fall out. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. But then you yeah. are adding that. Uh, uh, so you so simply your sum is bigger, right? Yes. Yeah. So you you your, your projection Q yeah, is exactly. bigger than yeah. projection Q. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So then count because... the domain is bigger, and then it includes uh, the projection exactly. which is sort of yeah. missing the counted domain. Okay. Precisely. Yeah. Precisely. And then and then we end up uh, needing to show uh, this isomorphism here, mm -hmm. yeah. which as I said re requires some more work. And essentially, we used uh, uh, the main idea is to use uh, the description of the corner of a graph system of a Kunz-Krieger algebra as a uh, Kunz Krieger algebra due to Acklin and Ruiz. So we follow uh, that procedure to show that this uh, corner is, uh, yeah, is, we know it is a graph system algebra. We use that uh, construction to show that it is precisely this uh, graph system algebra. And moreover, we also need a um, result following by this classification result by Eilers, Rostov, Ruiz, and Johnson. Yeah. Okay, so now. Um, I will like to move on uh, with this classification part. So um, let me first describe this classification chart. Of this, uh, of graph sister algebras where E is a finite graph um, by Eilers, Rostov, uh, Ruiz, and Sanson. Okay, um, so first call some notation. So we have that AE, it denotes the adjacency matrix um, for the graph E, uh, indicating how many edges we have uh, between a pair of vertices. And then we define BE to be AE minus the identity matrix. So now, um, in this classification results, uh, they um, classified these finite graph systems by using the ordered reduced filtered K theory, where the main idea is to look at the K theory of all ideals and sub quotients and map between them. Uh, but this boils down to something which is more, um, which is easier to work with, um, which is um, SLP equivalence uh, in the case where we have some conditions on the graph. Um, and this is precisely in the case where, um, where the graph sister algebra is type one or post liminal. Um, so we will consider we will consider a type one um, graph sister algebras, and a, a graph sister algebra is type one if and only if. E has no vertices um, supporting two distinct return paths. So you don't have two paths. Uh, you can choose such that you get back to V again. And this is true uh, for these quantum lens spaces because we know they are the base of um, a cycle. Oh, sorry, of a loop, uh, but you don't have, you only have edges going down uh, when, if you think about it as these different levels. Um, yeah. So we are definitely in uh, this case. Um, and then, as I said, sorry, Sophie, case, I'm confused. What did you write hmm? here? Two distinct what? Sorry, uh, two distinct return paths. Return paths, what do you mean? Yeah. What is a return path? So you, you have a return path if you have two different paths, two separate paths, such that you can come back to that vertex again. So you mean loops, right? You have two different loops based. Uh, on not, this. not, yeah, loops or cycles, cycles. Yeah, cycles, yes. Yeah, yeah, cycles, yeah. Two different cycles, yeah, exactly. So you can come back to the vertex again. Okay, so so an and example then, would be I have a vertex. And then I have one cycle of length one. Oops, sorry. Okay. I just uh, and and then I have say one cycle of length two. Yeah. Then I have yeah, two exactly. different return paths, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. But in our case, we only have this one uh, loop, and we don't have any other cycles coming back to the okay. vertex. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So in in this case of these type one uh, of in with this condition here on on the graph, uh, we have that this classification result. Sorry, could you tell me uh, which uh, uh, direction of this uh, implication is uh, more difficult? Oh, I, I should be. I, I actually I haven't looked at this direction uh, at this proof, uh, so I'm not aware of that. Okay, um, and how so, old yeah. is this result? It is something <laughs> very known, or um, again, I, I'm not sure about that. I don't know. Maybe maybe Sean knows that. Uh, I don't know if he's still listening. Um, Who? Uh, Sean Eilers. Maybe. Ah, sorry, no, I'm, I'm afraid he left. Yes. Ah, he left. Okay, sorry. Yes. Uh, but um, I can find you a reference uh, afterwards if you want. Okay, I would be great. I don't. I don't remember it in my top of the yeah right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, I have. I have mainly been looking at this condition on the graph and then using that in yeah. their classification result. In that case, uh, we we get this um, nice classification result. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now uh, this cl the classification result um, uh, reduces to what is called SLP equivalence, which is more nice to work with uh, than this uh, reduced uh, filter with K theory. So let me let me explain for you what we mean by this SLP equivalence. So now if we let um, P be a set containing some numbers from one to n. Um, and this should be a partial order with set, such that, and, and I don't know the order uh, like this, <clears throat> such that if I is uh, less than or equal to j in this partial ordering, then I is less than or equal to j in the usually ordering um, on natural numbers. Okay, um, so now we let m p one set. Uh, we let this be. This is the set of upper triangular n times n matrices. which satisfies that a i j, so uh, the a i, the i j, the entries of that matrix is different from zero implies that i is less than j in this partial ordering. And they are then indeed upper triangular um, also by this fact because we require uh, this part here. Okay, uh, then we have that as LP of one set. I will explain for you in a minute why we have this one uh, set showing up. Uh, these are all matrices inside MP of one set uh, whose diagonal uh, consists of one. And then we say that if we have two matrices in MP one set, then they are SLP equivalent if they exist a U and V inside this SLP one set um, such that UAV equals B. Okay, so this one showing up here, it, it tells you that, uh, that this is because in our case, we will just have that the block structure is just one times one matrices. Um, but in general, you can also define it by for other uh, block, uh, for other matrices with another block structure. Um, but in our case, this is not. Okay, so let, let me relate this uh, to our setting with these graph system algebras and this classification result. Um, so we need the notion of uh, being, sorry, 
for B i B F. Um, being in what is called the standard form. So this is the last thing I need to state this classification result. And here we have E and F are still finite graphs. So um, the definition of being in standard form, it's quite technical. I will only give you an, the idea of uh, what it means. And in the, in, in the case of these quantum land spaces, um, the, many things in this, that definition um, is surely true. Um, so it's not that difficult in that cases, but in general, the definition is quite technical. So, but it means essentially it, the intuition is that uh, we have um, the same size, that these two matrices should have the same size. Remember that BE is the adjacency matrix minus their density. So they should have the same size. Uh, they should also have the same block structure. Um, or as I said, we, we will just have one times one uh, block structure, but uh, it has something to do with how you have to order your vertices. Because when you write up your adjacent matrix, you can just choose however you want uh, to, uh, in which direction you want to have uh, your vertices, but here we need them in a specific order. Um, and then we have one more thing uh, that they uh, should also have the same what is called temperatures. And I will not go much into that these temperatures, but it means that um, the types of these gate simple sub quotients, uh, they have to match up uh, for these two graphs, the style graphs. Okay, um, and then uh, we have that this And why do you call it a temperature? What do you say? Why, why do you call it a temperature? Um, so, so it's a map where you assign some values minus one, zero, and one. Um, I'm not sure if if that's an explanation of it. Um, I, I'm actually not sure why it's called uh, temperatures. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. Um, yeah. Is is this somehow related to the KMS condition or? Yeah, that's what crossed oh. my mind, but I. Okay, I, I don't know anything about that. Um, That's exactly what crossed my mind, but I don't mm. think so. Okay, mm. okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, but then this uh, structure of these ideals here, uh, this is actually built into um, um, this, yeah, this construction. So it has, uh, yeah, so, the ideal structure of these ideals here has something to do with how you want to order your vertices. So this P here is chosen, this is chosen such that uh, we have an order reversing um, isomorphism from P uh, to this uh, set here of all these um, components, which in our case will just be uh, these strongly connected components. And the order uh, over here, here we say that if we have some gamma one and gamma two inside this gamma E, then we say that gamma one is less than gamma two. Um, if there exists a V1 in gamma one uh, and a, um, V2 in gamma 2, uh, such that we have a path from V2 to V1. In our case, uh, since these are just single tons of vertices, uh, it would just correspond to having a path from that particular vertex. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so we need to have such an order reversing isomorphism and that's how you see why, uh, how this ideal structure actually comes into the construction. Um, and um, these two matrices, BE and BF, now I write it like this, uh, they should be in MP of one set. So um, it's not always true that it is precisely BE and BF for these two 
uh, these two uh, graphs, which should be inside this MP1 set. Remember that MP1 set uh, is defined uh, by this, um, with these conditions here, where you see you have the partial ordering here. Um, in some cases, you need to modify your graph uh, into another graph, which is still isomorphic or stable isomorphic to, uh, yeah, such that the graphs you start with are still isomorphic or stable isomorphic. Um, yeah, so there's something more uh, to this uh, definition, uh, but I hope this gives you an idea of um, what, um, yeah, what the intuition is, uh, that you have to order your um, vertices into Yes, in a specific way, which also encodes uh, the structure um, of these ideals. Okay, so now um, I can give you this theorem uh, by Eilers, rest of Ruiz and Sanson from 2018. Okay, so here they say that if we let E and F be finite graphs such that the graph sister algebras are type one. So now we have that if uh, this B E B F is in standard form. Then the graph sister algebras, they are isomorphic. If and only if there exists some uh, matrices U and B and SLP of one set such that U, B, E, and then we have this which you have B, B, F, which uh, such that this is true. So meaning that these two matrices should be SLP equivalent. Uh, this graph here is the graph um, where you take E and then you have to add a loop to all sinks. In our case, we don't have any sinks. So in our case, this is just a graph E. Okay, so now you see that if we are in the case of these uh, type one graphs, these type graphs, and we have uh, ordered our matrices in a in the in the standard form, uh, then we can determine if they are isomorphic uh, completely by this SLP equivalence, which boils down to uh, some matrix algebras. Um, I should also mention here that uh, in the result in the uh, in this paper from 2018 here, they have stable isomorphism, yeah, that these are stable isomorphic, uh, but then in a paper um, a couple of years after that, um, they showed that this is also, um, that this is for these type one um, graphs algorithm for, for which this is in standard form, uh, stable isomorphism and isomorphism is actually equivalent in this case. So that's why I changed it. And can you tell me, please, what this group is, this group of matrices? These are what matrices? Yeah. Okay. So uh, I have them here. So they are all the matrices inside this MP here. So they have to satisfy this condition here coming from uh, this partial ordering, um, telling you when you can have that the entries are zero uh, mm -hmm. and they are upper triangular. And then what makes them into this, yeah, why they're into in this SLP? is because they have a diagonal, uh, con the diagonal consists only of ones. So, so this P uh, is, is the size of a matrix? The P? Yeah. So the P is this partial order itself, uh, but it consists of numbers up to... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so, so, so you, you fix the size of a matrix and you sort of order the basis at which you take your matrix. Yeah, yeah, you you order these these vertices such that yeah. it fits together with this isomorphism. You have to to pick here, uh, which encodes this ideal structure. Yeah. And, and because I'm confused by this one mm -hmm. z, you have this one and z. Yeah, so it's because you can have a more general definition where you have instead of having one. So one here is actually a, a what do I say a, a big one here uh, mm -hmm. consisting of some one one one. Uh, but then you could also have some M 
which consists of some, some numbers, so some multi-index, um, and then you would have some block structure instead of having just one times one block structure. So this one just indicates that the struct block structure is one times one, but if you had another block structure, then uh, instead of having uh, that the entries should satisfy this condition, uh, then you would have a condition on each block, uh, yeah. and then um, SLP equivalence will correspond to that the uh, blocks on the diagonal should have determinant one. Okay, so this means that we have yeah. one block. Okay. Mm -hmm. Exactly. We just have, yeah, exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. you can also see it like that. Yeah. Okay. So it's just a more simple, um, mm -hmm. yeah, case we are in. Okay, so now uh, let me, yeah, let me explain what uh, this uh, theorem means for uh, these quantum land spaces. Yes. So um, let me fix this order of the acting group. I will come back to it later. Um, and then we will have our focus on uh, dimension seven. Um, the reason is that when we set off the adjacent matrix for dimension seven, then we also will get um, the ones for dimension three and five. So let's just focus on that. Um, okay, um, so now we assume this will be our condition. So we assume that the greatest common divisor of MI and R is different from one uh, for precisely one I. Okay, uh, and th this is the condition we will use in our classification. So we will look at um, quantum land spaces of dimension seven, where we assume that the greatest common divisor is different from one for precisely one I. Okay, so then we have we have four um, different cases. And I ranges on, from I ranges from one to four. Hmm. Am I right? Zero to to three. Yeah. Sorry, zero to three. Yeah, yes, yeah, yes. yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, okay, so it depends on, of course, of which um, of these weights. Uh, is not the uh, where the greatest common divisor is different from one. So we have these four different cases. I will denote them like K one one one, uh, where um, these are not these are not the weights, but it means that the greatest common divisor between M zero and R is K, and the rest of them is one, and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, in that case, um, this is just a sketch of these uh, graphs. Then remember we have uh, that this graph, um, which is isomorphic uh, for which these quantum lens spaces are isomorphic to the graph system. It has a structure like this, where you have some edges going uh, down uh, here. So a number of edges going down here, depending on the number of admissible paths. Okay, um, so this is the first case where the greatest common divisor of M zero R equals K. Then we have, um, one k one one case uh, so here we will have at the second level we will have two vertices so it looks like this and of course we have some edges between them um, only going in this direction this is the same for all of them and then we have this one one k one case um i think you see it now okay Sorry, I should write here that we would have k of them, k loops here. So at level two, we will have k uh, vertices. And here at level three, uh, we would have k vertices, which are all the base of the loop. Um, and then in the last one, uh, here we would have K with vertices. In the last level. And some edges connecting them. So these are the four cases we have. Okay, so now the question is. So okay, so we immediately we see just by the ideal structure that uh, quantum lens spaces from two different of these cases cannot be isomorphic because the ideal structure will be different. So we need to work inside each of these four uh, different cases. Uh, and then determine on if uh, when two quantum lens spaces are isomorphic, um, and that's where we want to use SLP equivalent equivalence. Um, 
yeah, also note that um, this number k here uh, will also, um, two quantum land spaces where k are different uh, can also not be isomorphic because then again, uh, the ideal structure will be different. But in this case here, we see, we don't see the k um, in this graph over here. Uh, but it turns out uh, by using SLP equivalents that actually in for seven, the seven dimensional case, we would still have that this, um, that quantum lens basis with different case can, with different values of this K cannot be isomorphic. Okay. So um, then for these quantum lens spaces, I just need a bit notation. So um, first we need to, um, call our vertices something different. So I denote them like this. So here we have V1, 2, 3, 4. Um, and similarly, so we just, we count them like this. We uh, one, two, and so on here. Um, Vk plus one and so on. Um, because then I let gamma i be Vi. Because then we would have that this gamma for L7 uh, R M uh, will just be gamma i, i from one to the number of um, vertices in this graph here. Okay. Um, because these set of strongly connected components, they just consist of single sums of these vertices. Okay, so now um, we have that the set here just consists of um, goes from one to the number of these vertices. Um, and we have that the order is the uh, reversion of that on gamma E. Okay, so it means that I less than J, um, if and only if uh, gamma I greater than or equal to gamma j. So our uh, order, to, the partial ordering on this p comes directly from um, the order on these uh, strongly connected uh, components. So now as a corollary of uh, this classification theorem, we have that if the greatest common divisor of mir equals the greatest common divisor of nir, um, for i from zero uh, to three, uh, then we have that the graph sister algebra of L seven R M is isomorphic to the ones for L bar R N. Uh, if and only if there exist some matrices U and V inside this SLP one set such that U B E V equals B F, which is the uh, yeah okay the E is this graph here and F is this graph here yeah okay um but you must uh, say that they are in the standard form right they are yeah but it follows I should have mentioned that that using this partial ordering it follows that we have them in standard form. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you use that partial ordering, then you will see that they it follows that they will be in standard form. So that's why the theorem boils down to this uh, corollary instead. And what if you would use the reversed partial order? Uh, the reversed one, uh, yeah. but then you don't have the condition you need. You need um, you need p to be such that there is an order reversing isomorphism between gamma e and p. Yeah, but when you would say that you have an order preserving isomorphism. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I see. Yeah, precisely. Yeah. The so one or the other. The... It should be just a yeah. matter of choice. Okay. Yeah, I see. Yeah. Okay. So now let me. Uh... I don't have that much time, but. Uh, let's look at this classification of quantum land spaces <clears throat> of dimension less than or equal to seven. Let me first uh, say that um, Eilers, Restoff, Ruiz, and Sonson, they looked at the case where the greatest common divisor is one for all i. 
And here they proved um, that um, if three do not divert R, then all these, um, then you only have one class of these uh, quantum land spaces because they are all isomorphic to the ones where you have the weights one, 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 one. And if three uh, divides R, then you have two different classes of quantum land spaces. So you have one uh, where um, similarly as before. And then you have another one where you have L0, R, uh, 1, 1, R uh, minus 1, 1, like this. So you see that um, either you only have one of these um, quantum lens spaces or you have two of them. And um, it also follows that for dimension 3 and 5, they are all isomorphic. And the procedure they used, and also the same as we have used, is that they um, first, uh, we have a program in Mabel written by Søren Eilers, which computes all these, um, at, which can, can compute the adjacent matrix traces when you give them the set of weights and the R's. And then um, it can also tell you if they are SLP equivalent or not. So um, using that program, we set up a hypothesis and then afterwards we calculate all these adjacency matrices and then applied SLP equivalence by hand uh, to find a number theoretic invariant. So let me um, very briefly here show you uh, some of the um, results we got here. So um, if we are in the case where the greatest common divisor between M3 and R um, equals K, um, and the rest of them equals one, uh, then the adjacent matrix will look like this. And uh, here you also see um, we have this X i's and Y i's showing up. And as you can see here, they become quite complicated. I will not explain it in any details, but you need to count all these admissible parts and then you get uh, a lot of sums uh, showing up. Um, yeah. Um, but uh, if we want to look, when we look at SLP equivalence, then it turns out that if you take the sum over all these XTs, then you get that they are congruent to this expression, uh, modulo R. And then using SLP equivalence, so setting up a set of linear equations, uh, then we were able to show that um, that they are if they are that they are isomorphic if and only if we have that this expression here should be congruent to zero modulo r, um, and we have these two conditions below here. And this requires uh, yeah a lot of computations to show this part. And let me also mention that this part of the invariant here is the same as um, I lost rest of Ruiz and Sørensen got in the case where the greatest common divisor is one for all of the weights. Um, and then they concluded what I wrote before, uh, that we only have one or two different quantum land spaces. Let me show you one more example. So here we are in the case where the greatest common device between M0 and R is K. Um, and then the, we only have these uh, four times four matrix um, because we have to remove these vertices to correct it. Um, and here again, we get a similar expression uh, but we cannot do the same tricks when, trick when we want to find invariant because we don't have all these XIs to sum up. So um, here we needed actually another procedure to find an invariant. Uh, but then um, here's, I have the theorem, um, which says that if you have that the greatest, the one, the weights where the greatest common divisor is uh, equals K, um, is the one where you have this L. Uh, so the greatest common divisor of um, L and R equals K. Uh, then for this last part I showed you, uh, you would get, uh, you have this part of the invariant here, um, which was also the case for this one by Alice Rest of Lewis and Sonson, but then you need to access, uh, add some extra terms here. And this should be congruent to zero modulo R. And then if you look at, uh, uh, these two middle cases here, uh, then you see that the same expression is showing up. And then um, when you have the greatest common device between M1 and R is not one, uh, then you need M2 to be congruent to N2 modulo K. 
and uh, something similar here. And this is the one I uh, showed you before. So, um, sorry, but why is yeah. it that uh, all these M's and N's have indices only one and two? So, what happens to uh, three, for instance? So it's because in um, so in in this uh, case here, mm -hmm. in, the, in the last one, you have the greatest common divisor of M three and R equals um, K, um, and then when you um, look at um, the invariant, then as I said, the first one comes from summing up all these xi's, and the next one, uh, those the two uh, with this m2 and m1, uh, it actually comes from the fact that if you look at this y t here, then you have this a2 showing up, and a2 is the inverse of m2 modulo k, mm -hmm. and in xt you have find it. you have this a1 showing up. And then if you do some calculations, then you can show that you, for these two to be isomorphic, you need um, that M2 and N2 and M1 and N1 are congruent modulo K. Uh, so, and it also has something to do with the counting method we are using because we need to have these uh, multiplicative inverses uh, in set mod, um, set mod K um, when we do the counting. So that's why it's yeah it's only for one and two and here it's only one and two uh, which is showing up. Uh, let let me just uh, summarize this a bit because uh, this might be a bit uh, complicated and uh, yeah to understand this. But uh, if we let U K be the group of all the units and set mod K, uh, then I have here a table showing you how many different um, isomorphism classes we will have if we are in depending on which greatest common divisor um, is different from one. And then it has some dependence on if three divides R um, or if it divides both R and K. Um, yeah. Oh, it should be a nut in one of these. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know. Do I have a couple of minutes, or should I stop now? Well, you, you have minus three minutes, so I think okay, it's okay, okay, okay. You, you can, yeah. I mean, uh, within reason, you can, you can, you can go on. Uh, but as soon as you uh, flash the slide again, uh, here when you when you write that all are isomorphic. Uh, no, no, no. I mean, go back. Uh, so, uh, yeah, yes, yeah, sir. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, when you say that all isomorphic, uh, do you still mean under this uh, assumption? That uh, the uh, GCD uh, all i is equal to one. Yeah, yeah, for this particular one, yeah, because the uh, the example they were looking at was only in the case where the greatest common divisor for all of them is one. Uh, so these results here are only true if the greatest common divisor of m i and r is one. one. Okay. And then we extended it to uh, including that one mm -hmm. of the greatest common divisors is different from one. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. The only thing I wanted to conclude with was that in the case where the dimension is three, they will all mm -hmm. be isomorphic. Also, in in our cases, for dimension five, uh, two of the cases uh, we will have that they all isomorphic, mm -hmm. and in the last one, uh, we need a condition they will not all be isomorphic. Mm -hmm. And then we can also show by SLP equivalence that R is also an invariant. Um, except in the case where we have um, the case K1, because here uh, you see that we cannot distinguish the deal structure um, when we have greatest common divisor of M0 uh, equals K, uh, or if it equals, yeah, depending on what K is. So here you can actually have that the greatest common divisor are different and uh, the R is different, but you still get isomorphic congruent spaces. Mm -hmm. Okay, then it was everything here. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Let's thank Sophie for Sophia for a very beautiful talk. And uh, now, if you have any questions, uh, fire at will. Any questions, please. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, what happens to this classification 
Uh, could you compare this classification to the classification of uh, lens spaces, uh, classical lens spaces? Uh, yeah, so actually I, I did look at it at some point um, and actually I have something here. Um, and as I could see that um, there are cases where you have um, where you have that they are isomorphic as uh, these quantum lens spaces, but you don't have um, some homeomorphic uh, classical lens spaces. But I, I don't have, uh, I don't remember the precise examples, but I looked at it in, in the beginning where I was looking at these quantum lens mm -hmm. spaces. Um, yeah, but I don't have any, I don't remember it precisely, but um, yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. So it's like quantum deformation makes non-isomorphic sister algebras uh, isomorphic, mm. right? And and uh, uh, in the same vein, um, let me remark, I hope I remember it correctly, but okay. I think that lens spaces are precisely examples uh, to teach students uh, the difference between being homeomorphic and being homotopic. And, and, and I think that, that you can find there precisely some examples of, of lens spaces, mm -hmm. pairs of lens spaces which are homotopic one to each other, but they are not homeomorphic. And, and, and I was wondering if you could have the same effect on the quantum level to, 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 to show, all right, these two sister algebras are not isomorphic, but they are homotopic, whatever you oh, choose it okay. to be. That's okay. just... Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, it could be quite interesting. So, so uh, anyway, this classification of lens spaces is very natural to me because it's also natural in the classical setting. Yeah. Okay, anybody else? Alexander, no questions? You mean me? Yeah. Okay. Um, you like the graphs, so. <laughs> yes, yes. So I'm mean, like I I talked with Sophie already like uh, <laughs> like she explained me a lot. Uh, so um, I'm like totally get satisfied. an unfair advantage over us. Okay. Yes. <laughs> 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 I nailed her with all my questions and like uh, yeah. Like, okay, and she survived. Okay, good. <laughs> yes, yeah, I mean it was very nice. Like uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Maybe uh, I would like to ask. Yeah, Adam, go ahead. A question. So, what is known about uh, about the imposing the geometric structure on these lens spaces? For example, some kind of uh, spectral triple or something hmm. like that. Yeah. Is so, so I, I I don't uh, I don't know much about it. I I don't know. Is Thomas still here? Um, uh, Thomas, Thomas, okay, is, because, Thomas is here. Yeah, because yeah, I don't know if you, you could say something, Thomas, because you you have been talking about um, if yeah yeah. If you so have I have to add that I don't really know much about it either, but uh, I know there is a paper somewhere where they find uh, spectral triples on uh, low dimensional quantum lens spaces, and was it quantum teardrops or? something where they have the spectral triples, uh, but I think it's like the three-dimensional case for the quantum lens space. Mm -hmm. um, but it's something at some point, if I get the time, it would be fun to uh, investigate a bit further, but I don't really know any more about it at this point. Okay, so you are saying that it is possible in some low dimensions, yes, but not, not in general. I don't know if it's possible or not. I haven't seen it done yet. I just know that there has been exhibited a spectral triple um, in a, like very low dimension, uh, mm -hmm. but like quantum metric space structure or something like that, I haven't seen. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, but quantum metric space structure is a little bit of a different story because it goes into the work of retail. Mm -hmm. And this is a current uh, ongoing project of Wojtek Szymański and uh, Konrad Aguilar and, and a bunch of other people. So uh, you don't really need spectral triples to do that. Yes. Uh, one thing is really to study metric spaces, you know, like Gromov does it. And another one is to do manifolds, uh, you know, quantum manifolds and non-commutative geometry a la con. 
Um, but maybe Andre, Andre Hitas, you are still with us. So please, please tell us. Yes. You know everything and more Hello. about spectral triples. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can yes. see you. We okay, can hear very you. good. So there was um, uh, something like a couple of years ago, uh, with, uh, we did a, <clears throat> some work on the quantum lens spaces. This is basically, you know, for the, exactly in dimension three, that was with Jan Yitze Wenzelar. Mm -hmm. So this is possible just, you know, by taking the spectral triple on SUQ2 and getting the spectral triples on the on the lens spaces. And this is interesting because, I mean, you get some, well, interesting structure. I mean, basically, I mean, for the lens spaces could be interesting, you know, to study, uh, as far as I remember, different spin structures, I mean, later on. So this, so there's been, there's been something in the dimension three as was mentioned, not that I know in, in any higher dimension or some more advanced, so say, or some more complicated lens spaces. But it's not like it's impossible, it's just difficult. No, this is, it's, it's, it's not that it's impossible. So certainly if you have, well, lens spaces are quotients, right? So of something. So basically if you have a mm -hmm. good spectra triple, like on the SUQ2, roughly, yeah. Yeah. Then you can then you can go to the lens spaces. Yeah. Th there might be you know some difficulties you know getting, uh, for instance, uh, some orient parts of the axioms or parts of the structure yeah. like the orientation or something like that. But generally, generally the probably it's doable. I may have to remember that all these lens spaces are given by C star subalgebras or C star algebras of quantum SU and groups. Because that's so how then, you define so then, you know, Maxwell you Man, and then you, you define, you know, with uh, fixed points yeah. of algebra and the uh, FIN group action. So, so you are always inside a sister algebra that might be happy to have a spectral triple, but restricting to a sister subalgebra is tough, just like going to quotients in the college is yeah. tough. So, uh, but at least you might have a starting point. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Andre. Ludwig, would you like to weigh in on spectral triples? No. Uh, I have a question coming yeah. back to, to classification. Is it possible um, that uh, given um, uh, the structure of ideals, there could be different <clears throat> uh, uh, graph sister algebra, uh, graphs um, leading to the same sister algebra? Yeah, surely. Also, in the case of, of uh, these um, quantum lens spaces. <coughs> so you said I don't if, know. If they had a different ideal structure. No, 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 no. Oh, what did you, you say? The, uh, okay, so my question mm. is what exactly uh, determines uh, this isomorphic class of this uh, lens space, quantum lens space? Uh, is the ideal structure, uh, and if it's um, if if not, uh, how many uh, different graphs can lead to the same uh, sister algebra of a quantum lens space? So um, maybe I can just add on this. Yeah. Like, um, so this is actually a question that I had, and like that's why I like uh, like uh, like went to meet uh, Sophie also. Um, so, you know, there's this uh, O2, O2 minus problem uh, that says that like you have two different mm -hmm. graphs uh, which are not isomorphic in, in like in, in no obvious way. Like you can send like a general, like you send, can send edges to edges like uh, to obtain like an isomorphism. Mm -hmm. um, but still, you know that like uh, the graph algebras that they give rise to uh, will be isomorphic. And uh, this is actually done really like with this uh, hardcore classification. Like I'm mean, like, so uh, like what also like Sophie is like uh, and uh, and Thomas are dealing with like that you have this used a uh, certain Eilers uh, Eilers rest of Lewis Sorensen classification. And uh, and the isomorphism is of course then is not clear whatsoever. Like uh, what does it send generators to generators to right? Um, or like, sorry, edges to edges, like, or what does an edge get sent to, you know, like, um, maybe some something like, uh, maybe does it get sent to like, um, um, 
you, you could, for example, imagine that like edges still get sent to uh, convex combinations mm -hmm. or something like this. Mm -hmm. And um, so this is like something that uh, would be interesting. I mean, like, so um, that to have other examples also, like, uh, like these land spaces might be some potential examples where you have an isomorphism, which is not obvious whatsoever. And, mm -hmm. uh, but I think then Sophie, like you mentioned, like when we talked about this on, on the board, um, that the, some of these examples, uh, when they are is isomorphic, then it turned out that uh, the graph, at least for, I think, n equals two or something like this, it turned out that the graphs are often, then the graphs that um, you, you get out from these yeah. constructions are the same graphs. Like they're the same uh, matrices, but then like um, yeah, yeah. So if volume. you if if you have um, this is what I briefly explained here. If if you have um, r equals two and m equals one one, and mm -hmm. you have r equals four and m equals two one, uh, then you get um, same um, graph. Yes, I think something like this. Like I, I yeah. don't know exactly, but uh, this is the example I, I showed you because yeah. um, here you have uh, precisely that the ideal structure is of course the same, so you cannot distinguish them by by this k. Um, so you will actually get isomorphic quantum lens spaces here, uh, even through r, um, the value of r and the value of these greatest common divisors is not the same. Um, but this is not true. Um, when the dimension is five and seven, um, which we can see by SLP equivalence. Um, yeah, so this is only so, something we see in dimension three. So there are different graphs then also you say like possibly. Uh, so what then you say, so then you say like there will be also possibly different graphs in these dimensions. Yes, yeah, so, so in, in, graph, in that case, you don't, uh, you, you cannot uh, have different values of R, different value of the greatest common divisor and get um, the same graph or isomorphic graphs, is that graph. So it has something to do with that SLP equivalence preserves um, the, the numbers above the main diagonal. Um, and here you have R and R divided by K. Um, and then you get that since, uh, th then you can obtain that, uh, that R has to be the same, um, and then also K has to be the same. Um, but in, in, in dimension three, you only have R divided by K showing up in the adjacency matrix. Um, so you cannot conclude the same thing. Um, okay, but do you know examples? Uh, that do you, so do you know for these uh, five or dimension five or seven, I think? Yeah. Uh, do you know some examples or generally? Okay, yeah, you, I think the dimension has to be the same, right? Um, but do you know some yeah, examples yeah, where you have, uh -huh. so mm. uh, like two examples of two quantum lens spaces uh, that give rise to isomorphic operator algebras, but uh, uh, but it's still different have like different graphs, yes. Yeah. And a source of such examples. Like ah, like, and they have a different, so they are yes. isomorphic, mm -hmm. but have different graphs. Yes. 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 Okay. Yeah, that can happen because uh, when we, um, so we can be in, in the situation that, of course, the graphs are the same and then we are fine. But otherwise, in, in many of the cases, we get different graphs and then we use SLP equivalence to determine if it's possible that they can, are isomorphic or not. Yeah. Uh, um, do, do I have an example? I, I have I have all the examples we made in Mabel, but I, I don't uh, remember uh, them right yeah. now uh, precisely, uh, okay. but yes. But this SLP equivalence will tell you that like uh, the graphs are, um... Will the graphs be more reader equivalent? Because well, you have some remember SLP how this one. Um, so you know, like you have some one graph and you have another graph, and for uh, example, you could say you could also define a notion of a if you take, for example, rectangular matrices. You know, like if you, you uh, I think you've seen this maybe, like you know, some rectangular matrix times another one. Like you multiply, you get your this uh, adjacency matrix, and um, like. Uh, multiplying it the other way around, you get the other adjacency matrix. This will be like uh, that's what equivalent. you mean by Morita equivalent graphs. Uh, yeah, yeah yes. um, sure. That's uh, okay. So that's what you mean by okay, Morita equivalent graphs. Yes, uh, because then you would. I, I see haven't. That I haven't. It's nothing I have seen before. So I 
I don't uh, mm. I don't know. Um, Because this, in this way, yeah. you could still justify like uh, that. What generated, what edges get sent to, you know, like um, mm. in a way, like uh, like just a matrix product, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But this O two O two minus problem is like uh, you don't even know like uh, of uh, such a Morita equivalent uh, equivalents implemented on um, like between the graphs. So okay. it would be nice even like to have an example like where you don't have something like this, like with rectangular matrices. Yeah. Um, Con pair of quantum lens spaces that are give rise to isomorphic. More it's like equivalent graphs, you say. Yeah, yeah. I think we'll we can look into that. Yeah. But actually, uh, this discussion prompts me to the following question. Uh, you just speak about isomorphic sister algebras, but when you talk mm -hmm. uh, graph sister algebras, it's very, very important to uh, distinguish between. Uh, uh, isomorphism, which is U1 equivalent for the gauge actions, and V1, which is not. So here in, in your discussion, do you have like uh, cases where, where this isomorphism is gauge equivariant and other with gauge, yeah. uh, where, where isomorphism is not gauge yeah, equivariant? So, so if it preserves the gauge action, you mean, yeah. right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah so actually I, I'm, I'm working on that with CERN. Um, we have been working on that. Um, but um, so I, I have been able to, if I look at just dimension three, to find, uh, then we know that they are isomorphic, but I have been able to find both um, to construct isomorphism where the action is preserved and where it's not preserved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't have some general result right now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But I, I can find an isomorphism which preserves the action. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, then the problem is showing that in some cases it's not possible. Yeah. 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 And we are yeah. working on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fine. So it was a good question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a good yes. question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that would be also like in uh, that would be also important for this O2 minus problem. So mm. if you know that this isomorphism does not preserve the gauge action, because I believe that like this O2 O2 minus problem uh, might be related to that you send edges not to edges, but uh, to pass. edges to pass, exactly. Mm -hmm. And um, and this could be like seen, for example, like um, in the in this uh, in terms of their group points, so that like uh, you don't have an isomorphism or a Morita equivalence between graphs, yeah, but between their uh, between their path group points. Yeah. Okay. But here and I should also yeah, okay, yeah. Yes. I yeah. Okay. Yeah. I should just say that in in this case, of course, we the problem is that we we cannot go to the graph sister algebra because we need to stop uh, before in these isomorphism when, when we have the corner, because um, otherwise, as you also mentioned here, that you have paths, uh, no, sorry, um, yeah, paths being sending to edges and then it's not preserved. So we need to, when we want to see if they preserve this uh, U of one action, then we need to not to go down to this uh, <coughs> particular mm -hmm. graphs is that right here we have to stop a bit before that if that makes sense yeah yeah maybe and, and something similar yeah another question occurred to me um you gave us a counter example mm -hmm. uh to 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 what brzezinski and szymanski were doing and i was wondering uh, is it the minimal counter example i mean you explain to us why uh, where they made a mistake. It's a very silly mistake, uh, almost a typo, but of course it is a mistake. And I was wondering if, if the, the example that you gave us, the counter example is like the smallest, the minimal possible uh, example where things go wrong in the procedure. Okay, so, so what do we precisely mean by minimal? <laughs> do well, we maybe you could choose uh, a smaller dimension. I mean. Uh, ah, okay. So this is the smallest dimension I I mentioned for you. Um, okay. Yeah. So this example I gave was dimension three. So that's the smallest. I, I, of course, um, yes, because we need. Um, I had I had two levels and then I had four vertices in each of them. But um, if you want to have two cycles and show mm -hmm. that it goes wrong, then you need four vertices. You cannot just have that R would be two because then you would just have uh, that the greatest common divisor between of each of them would be one. So you, this would be the smallest example. Um, 
Wait, yeah. but we have more parameters. So, so, so mm -hmm. first is R, and you are saying that R must be at least four to have a counterexample, right? That's, mm -hmm. but, but, but you must have at least four element group. But I'm also interested uh, in this dimension. So you have L two N plus mm -hmm. one. So, so is it? Uh, and your N was, I believe, you you are working with, with seven dimensional lens spaces, right? Yeah. So the but one I gave three. the counterexample was. Uh, no, yeah. So, so the one I gave the counter example. Okay, it's because uh, then you have n equal one. So it, it yeah. So I was working with L three. Uh, so ah. n equals one. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. So that's. So when I is, when I say mean. dimension three, I mean okay. two n plus one when n equals one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No, that's clear. Yeah. Okay, I'm happy. Any other questions to Sophia now? I have a question. Okay. So assume that that we fix. Uh, the ideal structure and uh, the gauge action on a sister graph sister algebra. Uh, mm -hmm. For instance, one of these examples. Uh, is it uh, probable then that uh, there is only one uh, graph representing this sister, uh, sister graph algebra? Um, but if not, what? Uh, what data yeah. is different from, from, from combinatorics uh, related to, to the structure of sister algebra uh, could, could select a, a single, single graph model of the sister algebra? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So, I'm, so the reason why I'm a bit careful with the sketch action is because if you, um, when you pass by this isomorphism, then it doesn't between these quantum lens spaces and the graph sister algebraic picture, then it's not preserved. Um, so, so that's why we need to, when, when we want to look at the gauge action um, on these quantum lens spaces, then we cannot pass to this graph sister algebra. We need to look at um, the way I, I showed that you can have something which preserves this action. It was to look at generators and the relations between them. But what you are saying is that if you have, um, if you just look at, at the graphs we, we described here um, and then look at the gauge action on, how to, on how these to see graphs. this graph from the structure of a yeah. sister algebra or from some actions on the sister algebra. Is it possible in the case of uh, this quantum lens spaces at least or, or not? Yeah. Right now, I'm not sure right now. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Is there a result uh, that, yeah. that, that fixing some um, structure of a sister algebra, uh, there's only finite number of, of uh, graphs inducing this sister algebra? <laughs> it also occurred to me, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's a very natural question, yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, probably yeah. if a graph is yeah. finite, then it's finite. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 this is true for actually many very important examples like everything in Sophia's talk today was about finite graphs yeah. but this is a, a experimental observation is it your uh, conjecture that if you yeah, yeah, the, the, graph, the conjecture yes is, uh, but but, uh, but I, I think this is something which i would find uh, plausible to to, mm -hmm. to prove mm -hmm. it's uh, I, 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 it's not like I have a proof in my mind, but uh, uh, perhaps somehow we could find some invariant that would distinguish between graph sister algebras of graphs that are infinite from graphs that are finite, but I'm not sure. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. I mean, one of the things that you have, this is what Shoren was teaching me, uh, uh, it was because you say Shoren, not Soren, right? Soren, Soren. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, it was that uh, uh, you have so-called outsplitting principles. So, so uh, because this Kuhn-Square relation of a second type at regular vertices are usually tough cookies in many proofs, uh, mm -hmm. you would like to get rid of them, and there's some outsplitting principle which allows you to 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 remove uh, uh, these regular vertices that emit more than. Uh, no, no, no. Finite doesn't mean unital. Finite means uh, finitely many uh, vertices. Sophia was also having finitely many edges. 
So yeah, like yeah. Uh, complex projective so, spaces are not part of a game. So I was just answering no. Alex's question in chat. Um, oh. uh, uh, oh, okay. Yeah. So, so what I what I what I what I meant is is that what you have is a splitting principle. You 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 somehow uh, double these vertices which are uh, regular and emit more than one edge. Uh, so that you arrive at, at the situation in which all regular vertices emit at most, uh, well, emit exactly one edge. And, mm -hmm. and this are splitting principle, I believe, it gives to you an isomorphic sister algebras, from what I remember. So, so it has some moves that allow you to, oh, to, okay. to do things. Yeah. But I don't remember assumptions. Maybe it was true only for some, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know for what graphs uh, this splitting principle really holds. I don't remember it. And and uh, this is what what faces we needed in order to prove uh, if and only if condition for the gauge action on the graph sister algebra being free. And, and when you ask such a question, so Szymanski proved the theorem in one direction, but uh, um, he proved that that a natural condition is a sufficient condition. Uh, but but we also wanted to prove that it's necessary. And we are working on it with Soren, um, and and then uh, we needed to apply this outsplitting principle uh, in order to to prove our theorem. And and we had this luxury that we knew that uh, if we apply outsplitting principle, we don't leave. Uh, uh, we have the same sister algebra, uh, including the gauge action. I, mean, I don't know like, whom you're asking. Uh, uh, <laughs> like, like you said, that you try to prove that uh, about these finite edges, something. Uh -huh. No, no, but, um, I, I don't remember exactly, but this is this is a very mild condition. So imagine that you have a, uh, a graph sister algebra and you have a gauge action, and under some mild conditions uh, on on uh, okay, but actually maybe not so mild. I, I think that that this was about sinks. Yeah. So, 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 for instance, if you take um, the Teplitz algebra, so this is the graph of the Teplitz algebra, and of course it has a sink. And uh, here the, the gauge action is not free. Okay. So, so, so basically, by, by assuming that your, your graph has no sinks, uh, then the gauge action uh, is free. And, and, and this is what Wojtek Szymanski proved ages ago. Uh, but uh, more recently, we, we asked the reverse question. Is it an if and only if condition? It's sufficient, but is it necessary? So, can, sorry, like, I think I missed it. Like, like, so can you say again what free means for a gauge action? No, it, it's, it's whenever you have any compact quantum group acting on, on, on a unit of sister algebra, you know exactly what freeness means. Uh, mm -hmm. That's the Elwood condition, right? Uh, yeah, you, you write your action as a coaction. And, 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 and then you have a map from the algebraic tensor product of your two sister algebras to say the minimal tensor product of, uh, so the complete, uh, and here have C of G in the classical case, and that's just the canonical map. And, and uh, the image must be uh, norm dense, that's freeness. How defined by this is exactly when Voronovich defines a, a compact quantum group, he uses the same map, but but for him A is equal to C of G. And this is just saying that you have cancellation properties, so the group must act freely on itself. That's how we define compact quantum groups. Mm -hmm. Because you cannot write the antipode explicitly. And yes. and and uh, so this is what is meant by free. So but, but in this case, gauge action is a U1 action. And having a U1 action means that your sister algebra is z-graded. And when the freeness condition means simply that this grading is strong. So, so it simply means that uh, when you have a m times a n, where m and n are integers, not only you have the obvious inclusion, but you actually have equality into m uh, plus n. For every m and n, uh, like integers, have, yes. uh, positive or uh, like no, no, no. m and n different signs? m and n integers. So also like M and M might be like minus one and plus one. Exactly, and and basically, basically it boils down, you know, to showing things that a, a minus one, a one is equal to a zero. That's yeah, exactly. Case. If you prove it, I think you're home. And and yeah. so, so freeness for gauge actions is something very very well un understood. 
and and uh, uh, I'm sorry, I don't remember exactly, but I I think this is about things basically, right? Um, and 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 then you can really relatively easily prove that uh, the, the the gauge action is free, so we have a strong grading, but but the reversed implication is much more difficult, much more difficult. It's true. And and it and it turned out that once we proved it, we found that somebody somebody else proved it earlier. So that really sucks. But 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 at least it's true. And we had three days of fun in Copenhagen proving it, uh, or, or whatever. Yeah, and this was with Marius Marius Tobolski. If he's still around, yes. Yeah, so he he might say he might remember it. So it was Marius mm -hmm. uh, uh, Søren and and myself. Can uh, you say? Um you basically obtain a characterization of uh, saturatedness. Uh, like there's this notion of uh, being saturated for- Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Saturated in the sense of, of, of Rico, right? Uh, or, or Phillips, right? Yeah, of course, yes. Yeah, these things are basically equivalent, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then there is a beautiful paper of Kenny de Comer and Makota Imashita, uh, mm -hmm. which deals with such issues. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. But, but you know, that case is so simple. You want such a simple uh, group that uh, you can formulate freeness in one million different ways, which are all equivalent. Yeah. Yeah. When I said saturation, I had a mental block for a while because you have saturated sets in graphs. So I said, wait a second, what oh, yeah. are you talking about here? That's completely different saturation, of course, yes. Yes. Uh, okay, I, I think that it's time to wind it up. So if there are no other urgent questions, let us thank Sophia again. Thank you very much. Thank you. This was really nice. And uh, I stopped recording. <laughs>